Thank you for being here. My name is Carolyn Catamaris. I am the Assistant Director at the Center for Digital Strategies. And thank you so much for being here. And thank you also to the Future of Automotive and Mobility Club for co-hosting this event with the CES. We are so excited today to welcome Kyle Keogh, class of uh, 99, back to campus. He is an expert on uh, change within the automotive industry. For the past 15 years, he's been working at Google and they're leading their automotive group, working with Daimler and Volkswagen and Range Rover. And um, he's also a professor at NYU Stern, where he teaches a course on digital disruption. So we are so lucky to have him here today. Uh, last time he was here was about five years ago. A lot has happened in the industry since then. So thank you so much for being here. We are excited to learn from you. And please join me in welcoming Hi. Thanks so much, Carolyn. It's, it's great to be always back up here. Um, as a tuck alum, I was having breakfast with some folks this morning, and it's just always great to be back in this area. It is so beautiful. So many things have changed. This classroom is exactly the same. Um, but it's still nice. It's still really, really nice. Um, but thank you all for taking the time. Um, I want to make sure this is helpful for all of you. Um, I'm all, um, so I could talk about two different topics in automotive. I can talk about autonomous, or I can talk about electrification. Which would people prefer? And by talk, we're going to talk together. Right? So there's only from inside. Okay, who wants autonomous? Okay, who wants electrification? God, that was like a 50-50 <laughs> split. Okay, um, hmm. you know we'll go we'll go electrification, and then we'll see as we get through it um, whether we can see if we can make the shift if we run, if we have extra time. Oops. Okay. So the way I like to teach these classes, um, so I'm taking parts of what I do as an NYU class, and just you're picking one of the classes, is really think about what are the key questions around an industry. So if we think about uh, the shift to electric, electric vehicles, um, sorry, I got old enough now that for the distance I actually need that. I'm fine with everything except for that. I can't read that back screen. Um, what are the primary advantages of EVs and internal combustion engines or ICE? What are the main barriers to adoption? Why have other countries uh, garnered it? Right? So sort of these seven questions are what we'll sort of go through and debate. Um, why don't I give you just a couple grounding facts though before we jump in, because some of you will probably know a lot about auto, some a little less. The US market is usually about 17 million new vehicles a year. For the past three years since the pandemic, it has gone down to about 13 to 14 million new vehicles per year. Um, that's all because the, of the production side of it, not the demand side of it. Um, so some anomaly right now is whatever gets produced gets sold. Right, and because you, if you want a car, you're going to buy one, and we're seeing anomalies in it also because all, what the OEMs did, uh, original equipment manufacturers, is they switched over and made the really profitable vehicles. So try to find a new Honda Accord. You could wait a really long time, but you want to find a tricked out Honda Ridgeline for 60 or 70 grand. That's probably right there on the lot, and they were happy to sell it to you at full retail. Um, so there's some anomalies at the current moment, but then there's also, if you think about that, the electrification market has a few anomalies. Um, one was a surprise from a few years ago is when the pandemic hit, most of them canceled their orders for, their, um, for a lot of things, but in particular the chips. And most of the supply lines are fairly well known, and so when you cancel orders and you re-establish those orders, they come back to you. But the chips do not, because the chips, cars make less of 10% of total chip usage, and so the chip manufacturers are like, we are now selling to the game consoles, so sorry, your chips are no longer yours, you're gonna have to wait in line like everybody else. And the EVs require 10 to 20 times as many chips as an ICE vehicle. So it really slowed down the production process. So the adoption has been slowed, not necessarily by demand from the end consumer, but more by um, supply side constraints, which was not predicted. So it'll be interesting, we'll have this debate about how this advances and your experiences and your perspectives. Just wanted to give those, a couple of those base points. Um, so the first thing is, what's the primary advantage of an EV versus an internal combustion engine? Does anyone own an EV? All right, we got one. All right. what, why'd you get the EV? Uh, honestly, part of it was I just wanted to be part of the trend moving okay. to electric. It was a bit of an intangible thing. But I also really liked the, there's definitely a sustainability environmental consideration in it. Um, I also like the, the torque. The acceleration is a lot faster, generally, than a, than a comparatively priced combustion engine. Um, and I think EVs especially are becoming more kind of gadgetized, like they're becoming more and more sophisticated in that technology, which is something I find good. Very cool. Okay. You were going to ask that? I was going to say, like, like, 
electric motors are inherently far more efficient than internal combustion engines. Mm -hmm. So as the battery technology gets better, ranges can go farther. Um, it can just be a more efficient system. Be more be a more efficient system. Be a more efficient system. Yes. So it should definitely be a more efficient system. Okay. Let's say lower maintenance and less exposure to the volatility of petroleum prices. Though you can model that and probably debate it. Okay. Um, some debate, some debate, and early on, um, some questions on some of those things. But the maintenance costs are dramatically lower, right? I've had one for four and a half years, and I've, other than changing the tire, spent three hundred dollars on it, right? Which is pretty amazing. Okay. So just from a government perspective, but there is a tax advantage to getting an EV. Okay. okay. Why do you think the government actually created those tax advantages? <coughs> Um, the environmental impact mm -hmm. to like subsidize it and um, create kind of help that environmental positive externality okay. take form. I think it's um, probably honestly more at the manufacturer side to incentivize them to change the production lines. And why did they want them to change the production lines? So you're right, both of you are right, but why? Um, I mean, um, real what? speculation. But okay, we can also go to the whole group. I don't mean to. You, if you're nice enough to answer a qu ask a question, I shouldn't put it back on you. I would, I would assume uh, the fixed call structure of like the PPE is pretty significant, and to make that level of capital investment, you have to have almost like the guarantor, which the government is really the only one to provide before the consumer market adoption. So I, I would assume it has to be kind of kind of like a, a subsidy to the OEMs to do that. To get to that exactly. So I was just say maybe it was also like the. Stick first and carrot. In some cases, like California mandated that yep. we're not going to sell any new gas powered vehicles by I think it's 2035, correct me. Uh, but then federal government came in and had to incentivize that in some way to be like, okay, we're not completely destroying your business. Yep. It's an interesting one. So you, uh, you covered a lot of them. Um, I'll go through these and come back as we. Okay. Hang on. Um, so the primary advantage, right? It's better for the environment, lower cost to maintain, as you pointed out. Faster acceleration, the performance is already better, um, less expensive to build, and then the innovation, to your point at the end, is actually dramatically better on them, right? Like, it's the only vehicle I know of that, that is now better four years later than it was the day I bought it, right? For me, dog mode, I have a 12-year-old lab, was like the greatest thing that ever happened. Like, I would have bought the car just for that. Um, the idea that I can just leave my dog in the car and get a cup of coffee and not worry at all is, is tremendous. Um, so these are primary advantages. The interesting part about this is we're still really low on the S-curve. Are people familiar with an S-curve? So an S-curve is you sort of, you start out, there's sort of a frothy early period where people get excited about something, you get some early wins, and then you get to sort of the beginning of, of some consolidation and you really hone in on the value proposition and you go to a significant scale. And that's when performance dramatically improves. So the interesting part to this, to the, even the question on production and some of the other areas is you've had, internal combustion engines for a hundred years and you've maxed out almost everything you can get out of that like you can make an incremental one or two percent movement every year but these ones will actually change probably 5x in the next 10 years in terms of their performance the batteries will get much more efficient the the braking will get better the in the in, in internal tech will get better they will last longer um, and you're going to see that they're very much at the beginning of that sort of a, that S curve, if you will, which also then has like a BCG experience curve side to it. So it was interesting for the government was they needed to figure out, one, if we want this, the advantages aren't yet there for most people, so I need to encourage adoption if I want it. The second thing, and this is what Manchin did, who's the West Virginia senator, he forced it to be made in the United States in order to get these things, was we actually lost a lot of our manufacturing jobs, as people know, for the last 20, 30 years. We lost a lot of them in particular in the auto industry. But by putting those rules in place and having them be, de having to be de built here and sourced locally, one, you lose the geopolitical uh, disadvantage you've, you've had, we've had in the last five, 10 years. But also, you're going to build and keep all those jobs locally. So that was why, like, if you put the incentives here and you tie the incentives to the production, it shifts all of it. Now, that has substantial implications for geopolitical tensions between the US in particular and Europe. But that was sort of a lot of why this was done. Because all these are great, but you have to get someone to build it enough to actually get to there. OK, let me go back. OK, what are the main barriers to adoption? Like, why is it not more adopted? Um, maybe the limited infrastructure of the charging stations. Charging stations, yeah. Everyone loves the charging station one. 
We had that debate this morning. Okay. Yep. Definitely. What else? Range. Range. Yep. Okay. So it's associated, right? I can't get from where I want to go. Yep. Uh, maintenance. A lot of people, especially in the Midwest and the South, are used to doing maintenance on their own car themselves in the garage. Okay. So EVs represent like something that you don't have knowledge about that you can't work on in your own garage anyway. Fair. Okay. F valid points that you can't do it yourself. On the flip side, it actually requires very little maintenance. It's like maintaining an iPhone. Fair. Okay. Good points, though. Also, like the motivators of like owning a car, a lot of it is the prestige, and in some ways, like EVs can be prestigious. But I feel like you know, my dad likes his you know double um, seven cars, so they haven't really made an EV. They haven't made an EV cool enough for your dad yet, huh? Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Fair. So there's a couple, people are working on a couple of those, but okay. Okay. I think to that point, I used to work. Um, on the advertising for Porsche and okay. struggled with is people who really value their value. Yes. Kind of um, and so they're trying to figure out how to like fabricate that in the EV. That one is actually a fascinating one. So they've been my client a bit over time. And it, yes, they have a very specific sound. But the Macan has been incredibly successful because the performance is extraordinary. Right? But that's, that's true. The sound, it, that's a unique one. And it's actually, it's, but it's an issue for a different reason, which is no one can hear you coming up on you, up on them. So it's actually a real problem, and also thinking about the deer are up around the area, right? The deer don't actually even see, hear the car coming, right? Which makes it even tougher. Okay. Any, yeah. I don't own EV or any car, but then I'm thinking like cost probably. Okay. I don't know how the pricing has like increased and decreased, but then I remember earlier they were like yep. more expensive. So earlier was expensive, the, particularly the new Tesla changes, and then the hot, the number two auto manufacturer. If you look at the entire group for EVs. Does anyone know who it is who wasn't here at breakfast? Is it a Hyundai? It is. It's Hyundai. How many of you? Okay, okay. My car is a Hyundai. I own there you it. go. So that's, first off, awesome. Because um, like 20 years ago, like you bought a Hyundai if you couldn't buy a used Honda, right? Like it was not a very good brand, but they navigate, they've navigated this transition incredibly well. That's fantastic. Yep. So yep. I would say there might be some hesitation because the technology is advancing so quickly that it's kind of like to try to wait till next year when it's even better and more affordable. And mm -hmm. like, if I lock in now, am I going to regret that? Fair. Yes, I think there's some lock in. Um, although the interesting advantage to it is the software side of it upgrades. But the batteries, I feel like each year are going to continue to get better. The batteries will definitely get better. The two sides are going to change in that is the batteries will get better and um, the charging will get better. So actually now if you drive a Tesla, most of the charging stations that you hit, so the, to that question, um, or actually can do like 700 miles per hour, right? So can do, charge you enough to do 700 miles in one hour. So, and since the battery is only 300, that tells you can fully charge in 30 minutes. So you can both innovate on the battery side and on the charging side. So you hit a lot of points. The charging network is the biggest one, right? Everyone has this idea that if they get up and they want to take a 400 mile road trip in the morning, that day that they just cannot, they've lost all the flexibility in life and, and life, is, life is over. Um, um, there's a higher cost today, right? The production capacity has probably been the biggest issue. If they could actually produce more, they'd sell more. Uh, Nissan was one of my clients, um, and they started thinking they were going to produce like 100,000 Arias, which is a beautiful vehicle. They're going to produce 5,000 this year, right? They're going to have no problem selling 5,000, but still that's not where they want to be. Um, and there's substantial uh, issues along the entire supply chain, right? It's because it's a brand new supply chain. So do you guys, do you guys still take decision science, XI? do binding constraints okay so there's a whole set of binding constraints to the other question one of which is your charging network is a binding constraint on if you took a value chain analysis on the consumer side of it but if you go back to the production side of it you've got one binding constraint is you can't actually get the materials to build the batteries they're and they're not actually available in the US they're largely available in China and so you want to build a supply chain for this but you're building a massive supply chain from scratch with new materials that you've never done before, and so you have to figure out how to source all those capabilities. The other really big one is you, most of the OEMs are built as hardware companies. They're really good at design, fairly good at manufacturing, really good at sourcing. What they're not good at all is IT. And this basically is a big iPhone. So they had to switch out like half of your employees to figure that out, which is just a dramatic change, which is a really hard one. Um, so the charging networks, the higher cost, production capacity. Um, but I think there's also one on top of this is just what is their ability to actually innovate fast enough on this? 
And Tesla can do that because they're a born of the web company, no legacies on these areas. Um, but Ford, has anyone watched what Ford is doing in the EV, in the EV space? So Ford is a legendary long-term brand. Did any, has anyone worked at Ford? I thought you worked at Ford, okay. Um, and they basically cleaved the business into three, three areas. They said the internal combustion engine business, and they basically said, we're gonna drive this thing for just near-term profitability. It's basically our bank in order to fund the future. We're gonna do a pro business, which is all about like delivery trucks and everything. But we're gonna put most of our effort into electric vehicles, and we're basically gonna lose money for the next five to 10 years in this, but we are gonna win in this space. And went all after it. But that required totally new skills and capabilities. Like you have to retool a line completely from scratch on the production side, but on the development side, you have to have a lot, you have very few physical engineers and a lot more software engineers. So it's a total changeover. So some big part of this is the value proposition is not developed enough because the changes required are so substantial. Any thoughts, questions there? All right. Um, why have other countries gained greater adoption than the United States? Why, for instance, in like uh, Scandinavian countries is like the adoption like 70%? I actually have a question on just the, the section you just went through. Sure. In your opinion, do you think newer entrants like Tesla are getting better at hardware manufacturing faster than the traditional are getting better at software? Like, which do you think is progressing faster? Um, so it's tough to, so Tesla has been producing so fast now that they've actually run into a lot of production challenges. Those are the things you read about, the stuff falling off and everything else. Um, so I'm not sure they're getting that much better at that side yet. Um, I do think the other, the OEMs are making a lot more progress on the IT side of it. Um, I just think, but that's, the IT side is where most of the value gets created, not in the production side. We have, uh, similar to Jeffrey's comment, um, we, we talk a lot about you know, like ecosystem adoption of like upstream downstream suppliers as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, like one of the biggest hurdles, I to my opinion, is like a dealership because they make a lot of money on maintenance revenue. Mm -hmm. And um, ha like, how are they adapting to, like you said, like, you know, four years, 300 bucks of maintenance. That's yeah. terrible for them. It is terrible for them. Um, they're re be very reluctant about this, right? Um, but the interesting question is there's 17,000 dealerships in the United States. Um, you sell 17 million vehicles, right? So that's like 1,000 a a thousand vehicles per dealership. That's not that many. So you could actually lose half the dealerships or two-thirds of the dealerships and still probably be more than adequate coverage. That's the concerning part if you're a dealer. You're looking at the future, and I've talked to a lot of them, and they have to decide this. You're going to lose your what's called fixed ops, which is your service. And even on the sales side of it, most of these places are going to much more fixed pricing, right? So you lose your leverage on the pricing side of it. Um, so you, there's real questions about the long-term viability of some of, the, some of those challenges. Now, what you can do, though, is you say, I'm going to be the winner in this space. I'm going, to I'm going to own Boston, so to speak, right? And I'm going to be the EV dealer for Hyundai. And I'm going to pump so much volume through that I'm going to more than make that up. But it's probably going to consolidate the market. If you are only 10, it, the top 10 roughly um, auto dealership chains only control 10% of the market, I think in the next 10 years they will control, the market will be a lot smaller and they will control more like 40 or 50%. Because in order to make these economics work, you're going to need that kind of scale and that kind of volume. But it's a scary proposition for them. And on top of that, not only do you not make more money, they're requiring you to put in all of these charging stations and upgrade everything around your facility just to have the opportunity to sell a product that is going to make you a lot less money than the last one you had. But it's, that's a big part of any innovator's dilemma, right, is not every part of the value chain is going to win. And if you do, but if you don't do it, that's why Tesla did it first, right? EVs were first developed by like Toyota and other companies, but they were so tepid about it because no, lots of parts of their value chain did not want to do it. But an outside competitor comes in, has no vested interest like that, and just runs all the way through it. But it is definitely a challenge for them. Okay. So why, the other, why is Scandinavia in particular so successful getting it adopted? I mean, one thing is, it's not because it's cold, because we know that sucks for an electric vehicle. So I like know that they have like standardization of charging infrastructure. They do. So it's like interoperable, and then their driving habits are really different. They go short distances a lot. Sure. Yep. So those are two big advantages. They do have interoperability. Tesla has talked about, oh, we're going to open up our network in the United States, but that'd be like the worst business decision ever. Like it is a, a tremendous personal advantage for them to have their own system, because if you try and drive, I love that you bought the Ionic. If you try and drive from here to New York, it's a real pain in the ass to figure out how to charge that. I drove up last night, I hit the charger in Brattleboro for 15 minutes and was here no problem. So that's, 
that charging network is a, bit, a big impact for them positively is also a reason, though, that Tesla's won more in the United States. Yep. And the driving habits are different. You're not driving quite as far. There's another reason, though, that's actually important. A couple more. It's just a guess, but there's a, a gas tax. Gas yep. is much higher. Yep. So, it's so they, they, and what did they tax the hell out of gas, and what else did they do? Yep. So they, so the gas tax is extraordinary. You're probably paying like seven, eight, nine dollars a gallon over there, although they do it in liters, right? And then they give you seventy-five hundred bucks if you wanted to buy an EV, right? So you, all of a sudden, the economics that we talked about earlier totally flipped over and encouraged you to go in the other direction. But what they didn't do is there are almost no EVs produced in the country. So they did something that's probably going to be great for the environment eventually, but they're not going to necessarily because their biggest one, like Sweden, for instance, uh, is Volvo is. You know, it's part of an, you know, is sort of semi-headquartered there, and this is actually they didn't they didn't incentivize their own companies. So, but they do, that is why they're making the changes, and that's an interesting one is the economics that the impacts that a government can have on a market are extraordinary. In fact, even Tesla probably would not have been around if not for government loans and subsidies up front. I'm just really curious. Um, population plays a really big role. Like, what would incentivize the government to take on more like debt on their Shoulders to be able to make this change and take more. So it's translating to population, like larger population countries. Sure. Um, so the smaller ones, what they started with, and even in Europe in general. So we went back to why people like um, EVs here in the U.S. Performance tends to be the main thing that people buy for in the United States. People actually really care about the environment in Europe, and so even the governments looked at it and said, "This is going to be better for the environment. This is from a global warming standpoint. We are going to do this, even if no one else does it." Or we're going to do this, and hopefully that's going to prove to everyone else the impact this has, and they will follow us. But they're, they're much more environmentally conscious in general in Europe, that's a broad statement, than the United States, right? Um, you know, there is some adoption in the United States. You feel better because you bought it, but you probably don't just buy it because of that. Does that answer your question? I would just imagine that it's harder to translate to, into a larger country where, I mean, there's obviously the concern for the environment, but there's just the economic concern, like how much the government but that, so what they did though is they taxed, they substantially raised the taxes on the internal combustion engines and lowered it on the EVs. So for the next five years, they're probably okay because you still have, you don't, you you're not going to swap. You're only going to buy an EV when you're ready to buy a new car, likely. And so you still have the revenue source that you get from all the internal combustion engines. But over the next five years, that will transition, and then you're going to need to figure out what do you do on the EV side to make that money back. But for the next few years, by raising those taxes, they've actually offset it. But they are, they are going to head towards a cliff. So that was the, it was a big example of how you can have government's, government impact and can, how government can define a market. Also, Vermont, actually, oddly enough, is one of the more aggressive ones on EVs because they've actually put in lots of charging stations, done amazing amounts of work to get it set up. The surprising part of that being with the cold weather, an EV is, is actually, you're not as good in an EV as you are in like Florida, right, where the warm weather is not an issue for it. Okay, um, how, okay, we t I, I kind of gave you the answer about how the U.S. consumers were different. Sorry, I kind of took that one from you. Um, which company will win the EV race and why? I mean, there's one easy answer. No one's going to take it? Tesla, yep, okay. So Tesla's run away with this thing for right now. They're going to have, t they're going to make 2 million cars this year, of which about half will be sold in the United States, and they will be like 60% of all of the sales in the United States. But what would it take to beat them? I guess you make an argument for a company like Ford. Mm -hmm. They already have the number one selling vehicle in the United States in the F-150 and in the ICE version, and now they've come out with an electric version. Mm -hmm. I personally will own one one day, just going to wait a couple of years until it's proven. Okay. Um, so there's the case to be made that people will make that easy transition. It's just like what I used to have, but it's electric, that sort of thing. Okay. That's a very good, straightforward one. Yep. Okay. I have a question, actually. Sure. Are we, in your opinion, whoever wins the EV race in the U.S., are they going to globally? Oof, probably not. Um, so uh, that's a very good question. So China, ten, China is actually the most advanced market from an EV standpoint. They're they have the greatest adoption, and they have a lot of companies that are already in there, and it'd be very hard for a U.S. company to get in there and be successful. Um, even the Tesla, I think, has a, I think some of them have plants there, but are actually tending to pull back. 
because of geopolitical concerns. They're like, okay, do I really want to be here? Um, and you don't want to produce in China and go to the rest of the world. That's become much, much more problematic of late. Um, so those two, at least, will be very separate markets. It'd be interesting to see how the rest of the world, like Vietnam and other areas, actually actually develop. But I'm not sure that you, you know, if we, if, we, if we have time, we'll cover a little bit of autonomous. In autonomous, I think there is probably a likely a global winner because once you get the data and you actually become really great at the mapping software, like who's going to want to get in the car that is not quite as good as the last one with no driver, right? Like you're, that'd be, it's a very tough decision to make. But this one, they're going to be so close and the production capacity is probably going to be such an important part of it. Yeah, I'm interested to see what Tesla does just in the next, I think they've been the leader for the past few years, but I'm very curious to see the future. Like, I know they just lowered their prices, so now they can get this subsidy from the government. There's also, like, Elon Musk and everything with, like, his selling share. So I'm curious, I, like, I don't have an answer, but I'm just curious to see what they do in the next few years, if they're going to keep being the leader. Yep, okay, they're fascinating. Um, I mean, I would think it would be one of the legacy players that's going to really invest in their supply chain, like going upstream. Like, I you know GM just took a stake in a mining company. Volvo just took a stake in a mining company. So I think that's going to be really interesting to see how that develops and if that actually turns into a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. Because I think sourcing is going to be really difficult for lithium-ion batteries, especially as we get to like 100 plus kilowatt hours per pack. That's fair. Okay. Very good points. Um, and it's interesting because Tesla has been the most vertically integrated to date around this. But now the others are at least putting the battery, like if you're building a new production facility or a new plant, you're actually making sure the battery manufacturer is right next door. At least that you want definitive, definitive guaranteed production. But you're right, there's so many components that go into the battery that you want to make sure those are covered. Any other thoughts? I mean, I know that GM is like complete or like their, their Ultium platform, like they're really excited and they're going to have like a bigger fleet of EVs than they did in the past. But part of me is worried that they're going to have the same supply chain constraints that they're struggling with now. Mm -hmm. And it's going to continue for the next few years versus Tesla, which has been like better vertically integrated for years. Yep. So that's the question. Do they have such an advantage that they can continue to push those suppliers and get that much more volume? Their constraint seems to be manufacturing capacity, not sourcing versus it actually seems to be the opposite for most of the others. So that could be a definite challenge. The other one that's interesting is right now Tesla, so when Tesla launched the Model 3 and the Y, almost all the sales shifted to those two, like 95% of sales come from those two. So they actually just moved down market. They moved to a 50, they moved from a $90,000 car to a $50,000 car. They didn't, they haven't really stride the market. There's no, there's, there's very little difference, or not enough difference in my opinion, between a 3 and an S to sort of argue to make $40,000. Like I looked at it when I bought mine years ago and I was like, Oh, so you get six more inches, let me clear, and that six inches is $40,000, right? Like, I can, my kids can deal in the back seat. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how it actually strides out in the way, because right now it's a very, a very tight market in terms of what the demand and what the other is. Um, okay, let me go forward. Um, the other one, no one, so there's also a set of outside competitors, a company coming from Vietnam called VinFast. Um, and a few others in China that'll be interesting to see how they come back out. So when you think about who wins, you want to think about what are the unique capabilities to win in that market, right? Who's going to give you the best overall experience? Right now, Tesla is the best overall experience. From a performance inside it, they're better for the, probably better for the environment. They have the best tech in the car. Interestingly enough, they have still not opened up their tech. One of the surprises is they haven't opened up their app store yet, because you would think that you know, right now it's just strictly them. They've got like Spotify, YouTube, a couple other things in there. But if you think about like what Apple did with the iPhone, they did a lot of amazing things, right? But when they opened the App Store, it actually tremendously improved the, the quality of it. And they have a chance for the next year or so to basically open that up and get everybody to build just to them. And when you do that, they would have even further amplified their advantages. So that one's a bit, it's a bit surprising, sort of says the control element of what it is. You need, ma and the other, so the, but then you get the question of for the, like the Fords of the world or some of the others is, if you're already good at large scale manufacturing, is that going to be the binding constraint? Is that what's going to be required? Is if I can make them, I can get people to buy them? Or is this going to be the quality of the experience? Um, I do think there's a brand, pr the distribution capability, right, of the dealerships. Like it's one thing to buy a Tesla, you know exactly what it is, you're so used to it, but not having dealerships, not having that support, like are people going to get over that hurdle? Yes, it requires very little support, but at the same time, you like to be able to go somewhere. Whenever I have to get mine serviced, I have to figure out where it is. It, all, it moves like every six months, and it's in like some random part of town where I'm like, 
Yeah, I'm going to go there and make sure to get there in the middle of the day. Um, I'm not going to, you know, not going to go at night. Um, the brand preference one is really interesting because if you think about different markets, the SUV and uh, light truck market, what do you think that makes up in the United States as a percentage of the total market of sales every year versus sedans? You can't really be wrong. I, I know I expect you actually know. Two thirds. Yeah, okay, you actually knew. That's right. <laughs> Pretty good for Yes. So 15 years ago, it was two thirds sedans, one third trucks and SUVs. It is totally flipped. And is there a good, there's not a single good, well, maybe the X, but it's expensive as hell. There's not a good SUV in the, in the, um, in the EV space yet, right? So that first one will, well, the, the Mach-E is kind of, looks kind of like a, a one, but the, the Lightning will be the first one and it looks incredible. So if you, people are buying the EV, but they're basically buying an EV in the version that they don't want to get right now. If you give them the version they want, will that offset a lot of the other performance differences that you want? Right, the financing options, although this has started to abate, like now people are actually able to finance it. You actually know what the resale value of it is. You're able to, pr to predict some of that. Um, and then the cybersecurity one is one that has not come up yet. But if you're, like, so VinFast is a small company coming out of um, Vietnam. They were not an automotive company. They basically grew up making EVs there. They're very low, low cost per, per layer. They can probably come in sort of at the way a Hyundai did 20, 30 years ago in the United States. But you're going to be like, okay, how, how much do I trust this car? And not just like, does it run? Does it do everything else? But like, is someone going to take over my car? What is going to happen? And even could someone, the China cars are an issue if you're like, okay, who's seeing my data? Where, where am I going? Who's, wa who's watching me? Those sorts of things. All right. Okay. Um, did we sort of covered these last two. Do you want to switch over and do... Any other questions on EVs? I'm trying to figure out, see if I can cover both this and autonomous. I'm uh, just curious from somebody in the industry, I'm a little skeptical on the net benefit to the environment, especially when you talk about like the mining capacity and just the raw materials that need to go into the battery production. Yep. Um, like the trope is like the U.S. exports the pollution. Yep. Like, like where did, like, is that even a consideration? Or I know we're, we're trending that way, but like in terms of net gain, it seems like other, other players lose. So right now, I'm not sure there is actually a gain. If you look at, in particular, what it takes to build the vehicle, it's so expensive, uh, so much of, a tr of, of an impact to it that it actually probably offsets the impacts that you get from, um, from being electric versus being non-electric. Plus also, so many, electric, so many of the power plants are actually um, run by coal. So you run the coal to make the electricity that then you put in the vehicle, right? That doesn't seem that much more efficient. I think it really comes down to the S-curve on this one, of which is you're such early days on it. Will it get optimized better, and will that actually be better for the environment? But at the current moment, I don't think it really is. The other part of it is what do you do with when they're, they're done, right? No one's figured out yet how do, you, how do you scrap them and how do you harvest them in such a way. So you have to start, there's a, what do you have to believe an, uh, approach to say, like, how do I get to environmentally better? And you have to believe, one, that you can run the batteries for a really, really long time. And then, then when they're done, you can actually find some use for that, that you don't throw them in the landfill. You have to believe you can find other things besides just lithium and other things that could be the battery, right, that can actually power that battery, and that you can have greater quantities of them, and they will be more easy, easily to, easy to extract and build that way, are probably the two biggest things you'd have to believe. Because if you can make one of these and run it for 400,000 miles, and you can figure out the battery is the big component of it, you can probably get to much more environmentally sensitive. But we've maxed out what we can do on the internal combustion engines, is probably also the view. Like, so if you watch a lot of the regulations, um, you, you know, a lot of it, like California tends to lead this, to your point, is they were like, okay, you need to get to this many miles per gallon. And so that's when they figured out, that's when they started putting chips in. It was like, okay, when you get to a stoplight, we're going to shut the engine off, right? That's going to save us a whole lot. When we're going to be, we're not always going to run all um, pistons in, in the, um, in the engine, right? We're going to run four, and if you need two of them, we'll run six, right? So they figured out a lot of the ways to get to that, very much driven by the government. Um, but I'm not sure there's that much more they can do versus I think the, the thought is the potential of what you can do on the autonomous side is that much greater, or the EV side is that much greater. So like off Ryan's point, I noticed that when it came to the newest EV subsidies, sedans are subsidized up to 55,000, Sedans up to fifty-five thousand dollars are subsidized for like seventy-five hundred dollars, mm -hmm. but the cap is much higher. It's like eighty-five hundred, eighty-five thousand for light trucks and mm -hmm. SUVs. Like, doesn't that just promote larger batteries? Like, doesn't that just promote like a 
less efficient vehicle with larger batteries? And like, do you think the government will kind of understand that and change the way they're doing business? Or <sighs> is this like a manufacturer pushed? Hmm. That's a good question. It doesn't feel like the manufacturers got too much push at all into this regulation. They were all pretty shocked by it when it came out in the end. Um, I think that probably more is a reflection of the fact that it's more expensive to build them and they're priced higher to begin with. And if you didn't allow that, that you wouldn't have gotten the same adoption. And if two thirds of the sales are in that area, then that would, you would have really encouraged people to just make the smaller vehicles where you wanted to have the full striation. So that's probably a question of the market speaking versus, um, the, versus the, what is right for the environment. So if you do a, a higher subsidy on that because it's more expensive, um, you're going to encourage people to do that, but that was two -thirds of, that's two thirds of all your sales today. And if you don't build that, is somehow, are you going to lose a big portion of the market, is my guess. Is, what's your perspective on like plug-in hybrids at this point? Like there's a lot of data saying that that's actually like the best thing you can do for the environment with a small battery pack, barely using gas, except for longer trips. Like what are your perspectives on that and how long do you think that those will still make sense? Um, so I, they struck me as a transitional item, right? Of it's more efficient, but it doesn't, it gets, it doesn't get the advantages of both sides, right? So you can go, but not for that long, right? It doesn't have quite the same power. Um, it is better in the short term, but I go back to the question on the S curve of as you get better in the spots, will you, is there that much more you could get out of those types of vehicles? Um, it seemed more to me that it was something that, you, that you'd get because you're like, I'm not yet, I've got the range anxiety, I've got the other areas, I don't yet trust an EV, so I want to have both, I want, I want to improve the environment, but I don't want to go all in on it. Now I think the EVs have gotten so good that probably look at it and say the performance is better, um, the cap you know, the, Areas that you're going to get from a technological standpoint are probably long term or that much better. And then as we get the next five years of it of people manufacturing, that you probably sub see substantial gains even on the environmental side. But it's also a question in the US of like, we care about the environment to be honest, but do we care as much as like Europe does? Like they care tremendously. Um, and the other question, but the other thing about it is the range is US adoption, even in EVs, but in most technologies, tends to go along the coast, what's called the smile, right? Along the coast, spit down through Texas, and then in, in Chicago. Um, when you get outside of those major population areas, you get into the folks in particular who buy like a, an F-150, and there's lots, but they tend to concentrate more in the Midwest. Those ranges need to be much more dramatic, and the power needs to be more dramatic, right? right? Um, and so when you do that, will you lose some of those advantages is one of the trade-offs. But it does seem that the market is sort of spoken of, I'd rather go EVs. And I don't know if you can get quite as much out of the hybrids. I think also on the manufacturer side, like something I saw at Ford when I was leaving was takes to develop a new engine, whether it's plug-in or anything, it's about a billion dollar investment for the company. And it takes like five to seven years. So you look at like as a company of a fixed amount of capital to invest in EVs versus a new engine program, you kind of see this adoption of EVs going way up. And what value can you get out of investing another billion dollars in developing a new engine? Um, so they're all, even when I was there, they were like not investing in new engine programs and shifting those employees, like you said, when they, sh when they broke up those departments, were taking people from internal combustion engine development and putting them in EVs. Yep. Um, so I think they're also deciding like that return is not there. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to even develop like a plug in. Yeah, that's fair. Um, and it, and it, once the market spins that way, one of the interesting challenges of this is it's so such a heavy production value. It's like most digital markets are truly digital, right? Like, and you, so ChatGPT, perfect example, right? Launches in November, already has 100 million users, right? This technology's been out for like 10, 15 years, and they can't, you know, you're at a couple million people in the United States. It's so small that you, like, when you go around this room, like one person owned one, right? Um, because you have to do physical manufacturing, these long lead time cycles. That's part of why the government had to do the subsidies to encourage the people to, to go after it this way. Um, and you have to bet, make these long-term bets. Manufacturing is just sort of, sort of tough that way. Um, so it'll be interesting. To, I don't see, I mean, Ford was the most aggressive of like, we're cutting off everything except for trucks and um, the Mustang, everything else was going electric. And even then, we're just building for electric. And almost the rest of the market just followed them and said, because they see the performance and even the environmental advantages that they can get in the future, so they adjust it fairly dramatically to it. Um, and this is a market that, remember, you, the car you drive today is recognizable from 1920, right? It looks a little different, the performance is different, but from like 1950 on, like, it hasn't changed dramatically, and now it's in dramatic change. 
So rather than going to um, autonomous, why don't we switch over to what are the impacts on other industries? If, so I think it's very likely this happens in the next five to 10 years. Would people agree that we're sort of in the direction where this is going to go? Okay. So now the interesting question for all of you is you're sitting here and you've got 20, 30, you've got 30 year careers ahead of you, is how do you think about how you want to think about your career? So one thing to think about is, okay, I want to be, I want to buy an EV, fine, that's helpful like when you decide to do that. You could go work for a Ford or work for one of the major companies doing this. But the interesting question is, what else changes as a result? What are the secondary and tertiary effects when EV adoption gets to say 20, 30% in the United States? Not just like new vehicle sales, but like 20, 30% of users. What changes? I think <clears throat> tech companies will continuously have a bigger role in mm -hmm. the automobile industry because I'm not interested in cars, but I'm interested in tech. Okay. So I think for me, I find that exciting and, and what can further be integrated and help folks. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm excited, but also also scared of, you know, like vehicles without people, et cetera, roaming around potentially recklessly. But um, like I'm from the Bay Area and there, in San Francisco, like my sister who lives there, she sees the cars all the time, yeah. the cruise cars. Yes. And there was some time. It's an awful company. <laughs> there was some time a few months ago when there was a ton of cruise cars all stuck at one stoplight and there was like all these pictures on the internet but it was so funny but like luckily no one got hurt but I think things like that it, I I have this slight tension with technology I can definitely understand the tension you know what the require does anyone um, you can't answer this question I'm sorry um, does anyone know what the requirement is to in order to put in a fully autonomous vehicle with no one on board what you need to have done in California or any state in order to get that to allowed you need to have done a million miles on the road with a driver at the wheel with no interventions and have an accident rate that is two standard deviations greater than the average for that, for that metropolitan area for the last 20 years. So if there is, it's like an average of like 10 accidents, you might, you might actually know these numbers, but so it's like 10 accidents that happens every million miles or something like that. It's a relatively low number and I think they needed to get below four. So like they had to watch it so closely. One of my friends was actually the head of GT, uh, go to market for a cruise for a while. Um, and he had to watch it so closely. Like if any accident occurred, they had to immediately figure out like, okay, we need to prove this wasn't our fault. Because like if someone else hit us, that's not our fault. But if we hit them, so you, that is the safety level you need to get to, to actually just put one of those cars out there. Um, now the flip side is go look around you when you drive and see what everybody else is doing and think, would I rather have artificial intelligence around me or do I want these people next to me who are kids in the back screaming, they're texting, they're doing everything else. So I hear you. I, th I think it's a very real concern and I think it's very valid and it's really slowing autonomous adoption down um, in, a right, in a correct way. I think we'll find a, a way on this, my guess. But I hear you. So, it's, so you would look at the autonomous side of it, okay? Because also autonomous gets a lot easier if you have EVs because then you can easily come bring it back, charge it very quickly and send it back out because autonomous is a very good chance it's shared. And so you can actually get a much more shared economy, um, and therefore you can have a lot fewer vehicles on the road. Okay. What else? What else changes? I'm curious to see what will happen with uh, the energy companies because if like 20 or 30 percent of people are are having EVs, then the requirements on the power grid are actually going to be noticeably higher. And um, as we're trying to make this more eco-friendly, uh, I think the last time I checked, there was already like uh, a tension between whether we'd even have the space to build enough wind plants and hydroelectric and solar to be able to meet our current energy needs. So I think um, the alternative energy companies and the power grids are going to have a really interesting time figuring out how to adjust to 20 or 30 people, percent of people getting uh, EVs. So, so that's a great one. Like the alternative energy one becomes much more real and viable. The other thing you wind up with is, is the question of stored energy. Because right now when you charge, like most people charge at home, like you hear about the charging networks, but the predominance of it is at home, and its predominance is overnight. And actually when you plug it in now, the Tesla, it actually tells you it'll be ready at 7 a.m. I'm going to charge it when it is, the grid is most efficient. But if, so if you need it before 7 a.m., you need to hit a, hit a button and tell me, no, I want to charge fast. Otherwise, it will just sit there for the next three hours and then charge from like four to six which is pretty fascinating and pretty impressive, but it will uh, address part of it. This is sort of like having an internal combustion engine car and when it gets to the stoplight, it's, it you know, shuts off the engine. But yes, the power grid and in particular the ESG side of it is gonna be a, a very mature one. But others? Same veins probably falls under like a tertiary effect, but where that charging network rocks up, like you said, a lot of people do it at their homes, but 
there's a lot of incentives to be had on charging destinations or yeah. like malls, retail outlets, restaurants, things like that, offering charging. So you go there and you have to spend some time there anyway, you might as well go spend some money inside the place or places where people go to work, which obviously that's a whole separate conversation about whether or not that's going to continue to be a thing, but large offices having charging infrastructure in the parking lot, things of that nature. Yep. Google had a fairly large one. The interesting part is you plug in, you're there for eight or more hours, right? And you only need the charging for 45 minutes. You're like, how do you rotate all those cars and everything? Okay, good points. One of the benefits is uh, noise pollution reduction. So I, I can't stand New York City for the for that. Um, okay. So maybe it might be a more amicable spot to be. Okay, that's a good point. Um, it's interesting. They're actually, um, I think, didn't they, the new, um, uh, the new Cadillac, I think they actually added their own noise too, so that you hear it, and they were able to pick the noise they wanted to that question, like the point I know. So they made it a very nice noise that you wanted to hear, but because you have to have, having some noise is helpful to alert everybody else in your area. Otherwise, you, walk, you drive up the street and you're behind someone, and you're like, my only choice is to honk at you. You have no idea that I'm behind you. Okay, but fair. That's a good externality. What other ones? How does, okay, sorry. Data privacy that you brought up earlier, yep. that's like a huge issue already with our phones and if it becomes more of a big deal with like higher adoption for CDs, yep. it, it seems like a creepy concept. Yep. It's, a, it's a very real one. This is sort of the, I know you were there, your car was there, right? This is how they also track your iPhone right now, your phone right now. It's like, no, I know you were at the murder scene. Your phone was there. Okay. Yep. The, I'm sorry. Uh, like funding roads, like right now we use gas tax. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just some amount on top of your gas bill at the time of the pump. It's more and more people go to electric. Um, that revenue is going to be declining. So then how do you create a system probably beyond just like tracking people's how many miles they take to actually pay for the infrastructure? Yep. So that's this goes back to the same thing as Scandinavia, right? For a while, you want to encourage a certain bit of said behavior, but once you get enough of that, you have to figure out how, the, how you make the money back. Totally. And I don't know if the wear and tear, the wear and tear should still be probably the same on roads is my expectation. Yep. The other one that jumps out to me is the, te the, is the apps, right? Like think about how much innovation took place. There hasn't been that much of innovation inside the car for a while because you couldn't get access to it. Um, the way cars are designed, like you design in the, st the system. So one of the students from a class to teach was like, the BMW um, uh, speech to text technology is so bad that they will never even, like they wouldn't tell customers about it. They'd be like, no, 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 no don't worry about that. You don't need to use that, right? Um, but now when you get actually built in from the outside, you can get the latest tech and an update on a two-week basis. It's one of, the, one of the moments where you actually, your car can continually get better and better, but it can get better from third parties, not just yourself. The last one I'd leave you with is how does it change the home, right? And this is a little bit of discussion this morning of, okay, you're in New York, you decide to move to New York City, maybe not you, maybe the others, um, or anywhere that you're in an apartment, you have to figure out how to charge at night and how do you figure out that, that charging infrastructure around it. I don't think that'll be as bad. The chargers are inexpensive enough in, around it. Um, and then uh, the gas station network, right? Think about it. If you're, if you're scared to be a dealership, which you should be, you should be terrified if you're uh, an owner of a gas station. So there's, there's a set of effects around them, but the biggest effect I think for and away will be the one that you said, which is it will maybe allow for autonomous, right? And if, if this is the gateway to autonomous, that could be a game changer that could be as big as the internet, right? In terms of you know, job loss for some folks, but at the opportunity that it creates, that you could live up here and be like, I'm gonna live up here and I'm gonna, I'm gonna work in, in Boston. And it's two hours, but I get up every morning, I get in the car, I lay down and I fall asleep or I work or I do whatever else. You could change the nature of transportation, the nature of housing. You could have dramatic impacts everywhere. School. So hopefully this was helpful and fun. Thank you all for taking the time. I really appreciate it.